Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the bench. Um, we're getting closer and closer to the end of the year here, and uh, I thought maybe I'd try to squeeze in one more little project here by before the year's end. I uh, don't know if I'll get this all done or not. Uh, things have been extraordinarily busy at work. If you've noticed, I haven't really been posting a lot of videos very often uh, like I normally do. Um, I just haven't had the time. Uh, I will say I tried to answer a big big batch of emails from you today and hopefully I got through most of them. Uh, if you do email me, I will, I will get back to you at some point in time, but I can't always promise you that I can get back to you um, right away. So forgive me in advance for that, but uh, I will get back to you. So what we have on the bench today is a realistic STA Model 2200 MOSFET powered amplifier with a uh, this is one of their first digital synthesized AM FM tuners um, I just skimmed over the schematic a little bit and it does look like it's pretty promising uh, one of the unique features of this receiver was the the output section of the amplifier uses a couple of uh, complementary MOSFETs rather than transistor than by regular bipolar transistors so uh, these have a reputation for being extremely good sounding receivers. So a quick story on this receiver. A um, long time ago and probably about approaching 35 years ago or so um, I was at a friend's house and he had a uh, uh, he, he owned a company that was a subsidiary of Motorola and his company built uh, communications circuit boards for uh, two-way radios uh, for Motorola so he had a pretty nice business going and uh, he said hey you know come down to the sound room and uh, I want to show you what I got so I uh, went downstairs with him and there was a brand new pair of uh, Klipsch horn speakers the corner horns and I said wow man <laughs> that's nice and he said uh, wait do you hear them and he, he walks over to the rack and lo and behold connected to those speakers is one of these uh, an STA 2200 and I said well man oh days you, you know you bought these big fancy expensive speakers and had them shipped here and everything and uh, driving them with a Radio Shack receiver and he said he said you've not heard one of these yet have you and I said no I really haven't and he said wait till you hear it and you'll know why I'm using this and not using some of my other high-end gear and man he turned this thing on and I could not believe my ears um, the performance of this receiver really surprised me for what it was um, it was expensive for the time but compared to some of the other high-end gear like the Macintosh and some of the real high-end Marantz and so forth that was around at the time this was really a bargain for its price and then he went on to explain about the MOSFET amplifier and how well it performed so ever since then I thought boy it would be nice to get one of those one day just to try out and to kind of do a restoration so fast forward all these years and a good friend of mine found one of these in his travels and he called me up and said hey you want this thing and I said absolutely <laughs> so here it is on the bench so let's get the cover off and see what's inside here well once again this one uh, is kind of filthy just like the uh, the little Marantz 2238 if you remember that video although there's no rust on this one as there was on the Marantz uh, it is filthy dirty and I'm kinda glad I have my tetanus shot up to date <laughs> but uh, one of the things I see right off the get-go here that really concerns me is if you look down here yep you guessed it guys that horrible glue and it has dried on this till it's flaky and uh, that glue is very corrosive now and you can see over here on the amplifier boards you can just see it there and it just kind of flakes off 
and uh, what that does is that really corrodes the the bottoms of the capacitors and so forth but we're going to do a full recap on this but uh, I will tell you uh, I won't attempt to power this up in this condition so uh, we're just going to kind of proceed with caution and as you can see here the bottom is much cleaner than the top kind of doing a little scan underneath here and uh, I have my uh, close-up lens instead of my wide-angle lens on here so I can't get the whole thing in one view but you can see it's very clean so uh, let's do a few checks and kind of see what's going on uh, I'm gonna make sure that there haven't been any changes made to it or any kind of crazy stuff like that and then uh, we'll start going through it and testing some things out all right we got some of the uh, dust off of this thing and looking at it <clears throat> I can't really see any signs of anybody actually servicing this amp or working on it um, but what I can see is uh, maybe you can see it too if it'll focus is a uh, telltale sign where this glue is actually starting to corrode some of the copper traces and so forth and that's pretty common with this so these boards will need a really good cleaning um, it doesn't look like any of the capacitors themselves have leaked so much as the glue itself has caused some corrosion so as there's a lot of comp capacitors in this thing <laughs> lots of capacitors so a recap job on this is going to be pretty substantial but uh, it's very doable this amp looks very serviceable I've never serviced one but it actually looks like it's pretty straightforward to do in my opinion this was between this and the STA 2100 and the 2080 and the 2000 uh, realistic and Radio Shack was at kind of at the top of their game with those amps and those receivers and if you remember we did a uh, STA 2000 on this uh, channel and it was actually really good and I expect this one to be pretty amazing as well so let's get started okay well we did find one little problem here I knew it was too good to be true I mean even though my birthday was this month of course I shouldn't be taking much credit for my birthday I really didn't have very much to do with it I have to give all the credit to my mom and my dad and to Dr. Nixon who at the ripe old age of 81 delivered me but uh, I really had very little to do with it uh, being born at such an early age I pretty much was just along for the ride but anyway <laughs> enough silliness the power switch is bad on this thing and it looks like and I can't really tell I mean it's I cut off the little tie wraps that were around her the little zip ties and they were original factory but it does kind of look like down in here somewhere uh, they moved the one power wire and kind of just jumpered them together so uh, which kind of bypassed the little switch that you almost can see down in here right here so the first order of business I think is going to be to see if we can uh, pull that switch out and maybe repair it because I have a feeling it would be a very difficult part to replace and I really want the power switch on this thing to be original and to work so I guess that's our starting point for uh, this restoration so another little birthday story here while we're working so when my dad was still alive told me about uh, when he was born uh, he was born in 1923 and uh, of course they were really poor you know being born of immigrant parents and uh, you know it was so bad when the Great Depression hit they didn't even notice <laughs> but uh, of course back then you were delivered at home by a midwife and uh, of course the midwife that delivered uh, my dad um, sometime later when he was in his 20s she uh, he ran into her in town and she told the story that uh, that he cost $12 to, to bring into this world it was $12 
for a midwife to deliver a baby. <laughs> and my grandparents didn't have the $12 and they never paid her. <laughs> and my dad said, well, let me fix that for you. And he reached into his pocket and he gave her the $12. So my dad paid for his own delivery. <laughs> So, I just thought that was a funny story. All right, let's see if we can get this silly switch out of here. Um, looks like it mounts in from the back. So, we'll take these screws off and hopefully the screws won't fall into the screw eating floor. We know how upset that gets Tony when that happens, huh? But uh go. I'm talking a lot on this video, huh? Some of you don't like that. You like just the meat and potatoes. Just turn it on, show you me soldering or fixing something or whatever, and then turn the video off. So I'm sure I'm driving the people with the short attention spans nuts right now, but hey, my video, I guess you'll have to put up with me. All right, so as you can see, this is a really odd looking um, switch. Not only does it have the actual power switch in the back, but it also has this little tiny gang switch up front. So you could see how you could just, there's no way you would be able to order one of these. So I'm going to remove this and uh, we'll get it desoldered out of here and try it out. And, um, see if we can get it at least to work again maybe it just needs cleaned who knows okay after scraping off the glue on the terminals and everything then I was able to get a hobby knife underneath there and kind of pry up and this little piece of fiberboard just kind of pried right off and right here is our switch so you can kind of see how it works and I think all that might be wrong you can kind of see these contacts are kind of dirty in here so we're going to try to just very gently clean it. I'm not sure how successful we will be. Um, the other thing I noticed is there is another perfectly good set of contacts in here. They're a little bit dirty, but they've never been used because this side of the switch was unused. So there's a possibility that we can use that. We may even be able to parallel these. But uh, let's clean it up and see what we can do. Maybe we'll save this switch after all. Okay, the switch is installed back in, and the contacts on that one side were too far gone to, to really clean. So they were intact, but they were corroded, and the plating came off of them. So there was no way they were going to make really good contact for very long. So I just moved all of the terminals over to the other side. I also uh, removed this original ceramic uh, across the switch capacitor. Because if you notice, it's only rated at 125 volts. It's not a proper um, XY safety capacitor. So I just swapped it out with a proper XY capacitor that's rated at 400 volts. So we're in good shape. So that's all set. I checked it out. We have continuity. It's very good. So we're, uh, we should now have power to be able to test the transformer. So I'm just removing, uh, I removed all the fuses to take these wires out of the circuit pretty much from the transformer and we're just going to check statically we're going to ring out the wires um, on the transformer so here's the first winding and you can see we have continuity there and then we're just going to move up here check this one and then we're going to check this one and these are our three main windings And it's good. Now, there is a little bit of a unique circuit on this thing in that there are two transformers. If you look over here, here's your main power transformer. This powers the receiver. But if you look kind of down in here, I don't know if you can see it through all the wires. Uh, you could see it better from the top. But right in, right in here, right here, I'm touching. That's another tiny little transformer with uh, several windings. And the purpose for that, it is wired directly across the line. And the reason that that transformer is in there is because this 
actually has a clock circuit on it uh, to tell the time and that transformer is your constant power that powers the clock circuit and all of that so uh, pretty neat little thing and uh, ring I ran, rang it out it looks good too so I think we're good here and we're ready to uh, put some power to it and make sure everything else is working all right next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna recap and kinda just statically test this power supply board and you could see if this glue wasn't so gross on here the board would actually be in really good condition um, other than some flux really the boards clean it's in very good shape now you know I always get comments about you know how I test things you know you don't really need to do that and again I have kind of my little method of doing things and I do things in an order like that the same way every time so that I don't forget something um, you're right some of you are right you can skip things there are shorter ways or easier ways to do things um, and you're welcome to do them that way uh, but uh, <laughs> that's how I do it and again same thing with this could you apply power to this and would it probably work probably but too many times I've had you know one of these caps be shorted or something you turn it on and you cause a component to fail right off the bat and you go from just simple recap to now you're troubleshooting bad transistors and resistors and things so um, I just found it easier for my myself to just recap the power supply if you're going to do it anyway and then test it um, so you might say how do you what if how do you know that it worked before or didn't work before I don't and I don't really care <laughs> I'll recap it and we'll test it and then we'll see if it works and if not we'll troubleshoot it and figure it out okay just pulled the first cap and you can see how cruddy it is here but the capacitor all in all is still in good shape you can see it's a 1000 microfarad and it's reading at 971 which is pretty good and our ESR is pretty low it's 0.6 ohms it could be lower but um, this cap actually would still work um, we're still going to replace it because this glue is just so bad and it just tarnishes and corrodes these wires it'll corrode them right off eventually as it dries okay we have that board all recapped and I'll show you that in a minute and um, I replaced that twisted cracked old power cord with a new one and just kind of put it in there tidied all this up and re, re zip tied it nice and neat and I have my uh, two of my voltmeters across the main filter caps I checked everything out statically and it does look like this thing was not touched or modified or anything I'm always a little bit more cautious than normal whenever I get one of those where is as is uh, receivers you know when these things come in you don't know where it came from you don't know if other people tried to work on it first you don't know what happened to it it's one thing if somebody brings you uh, their personal piece of equipment and they know the history of it and they tell you hey I was using it and it just stopped working troubleshooting those is a lot faster because there's a lot of things that you can kind of assume that uh, you know nobody's been in there poking around if you know the person that that owned it but when you buy something off of an estate sale or off of eBay or just comes out of nowhere where you don't know you really need to do all those extra precautions so we've done that everything looks to be okay I don't see any shorts I don't see anything uh, that looks like it's gonna cause us any problems so we're now gonna plug this cord into the dim bulb tester and the first thing we're gonna look at is to see if we have our uh, clock so let's spin this around and sure enough we have a clock it says a.m. a little bit hard to see through the camera um, looking at the face plate this first button is the clock set and then over here it says hour and minute so if we kind of scroll down so you can kind of see everything here I should be able to hit this and yep good and minute okay so that's all working 
very good so the clock is working so that means the uh, that little tiny transformer is working fine and I'm still connected to my dim bulb over here if you look I have it switched to limit and I have my bulb let's turn the power on and see what we get and that's what we want we just want the bulb to flash on and then dim down I don't hear the protect relay kicking in but that's because we're still on the limit and you can see we have negative 33 volts here and positive 33 up here um, all right let's go for broke and put it on full power and there it goes so we have about 49 almost 50 volts and uh, that's on the negative rail and 49 on the positive rail so that's good and I did hear the protect relay kick in so the amplifier technically right now is turned on which is great news that means we don't have a shorted MOSFET or, or uh, a shorted capacitor or anything like that uh, this is all great news okay we have an antenna connected and we're all plugged in and ready to check it so let's uh, turn this around and come down here and our clock is running so let's uh, turn this on and see if it comes on all right looks like our meters kind of funny let's see if there I have some speakers connected Sounds of the season all. All right, it works. Let's see if it'll tune. I let my mistakes kind of take over my. All right. Wow. So it is working. Uh, the the pot needs cleaned for sure, but uh, some of the controls are dirty. The meter is kind of weird. We have one thing here one that's lit up all the time and here's the high and low meter so definitely something wrong with the meter but by and large the receiver is working fine so all we need to do is give it a good cleaning and we can do the recap on it and uh, check the alignment so this looks like this is going to be a good receiver no major problems so I have the first amplifier module out to uh, do the uh, recap on it and to go over it and this is a really slick design so you basically have four screws and they just screw into the back um, let's see here right up in here so this goes in here there's the four screws go into the bracket through the rear and that's all that holds it in and then you have one connector on here and one connector on here and then you have the uh, the little thermal sensor right here and it just slides in and is held in with a little like a little metal spring clip and the whole amp comes out five minutes so very very service friendly on this which is really cool um, and then to get this board off of the big heat sink if you notice here's your two MOSFETs and you just take the screws out and they're socketed so if you see right here you have a couple little sockets as soon as you take this screw out these transistors will pull out and the socket is actually attached to the board so as soon as you get the transistors out these four screws also act as the mounting for the board to the heat sink so once you pull the transistors the whole board comes off the heat sink another five minutes very simple and then we can work on it so like I said so far I'm really liking the design of this thing well we're making pretty good progress here on the recap and uh, while I'm working on this I was kind of just thinking about a few things and reminds me of a story a guy I used to work with used to be a business partner of mine a long time ago uh, he spent 12 years in the Navy as a sonar tech so that's where he got his training from and uh, he uh, told me a story about this junior enlisted that just started and he was just getting his electronics training and they figured they'd 
let him work on something for a little bit and they brought a circuit board out to him and he was working on it and he comes running out and he's got his finger on one of the components you know holding it as he comes out and he looks you know goes comes up to my buddy and he says hey i think i figured out what's wrong with this you know and friend says yeah well what is it and he said this capacitator ain't capacitating <laughs> dave kind of looked at him for a minute and said what <laughs> this capacitator ain't capacitating and he looks at what he's holding and he says but that's a transistor you're touching and the kid didn't even miss a beat he says oh well it ain't doing that either <laughs> i can't make this stuff up anyway back to work all right, so we're all recapped and uh, got the faceplate put back on and cleaned up. And uh, I guess we can check and see if these capacitators is capacitating or not. Um, <laughs> the other thing is um, this particular unit has a little compartment back here for a 9-volt battery. And that's supposed to retain the memory for the clock and the uh, presets. And those batteries are notorious. <laughs> I don't know if this thing uses vacuum tubes for the for the clock or what, but this thing will suck down a 9-volt battery in about 6 or 7 hours. It's really kind of like the old LED alarm clocks, you know, that, that ba way back in the day that had the 9-volt batteries. When the power would go out, those batteries would hold your time only for a couple of hours, and it would kill the battery. And that's kind of the, the generation that this particular unit's from. So uh, let's try it out and see if everything works. Okay, we have the amplifier connected to an 8 ohm dummy load, and we have the uh, signal generator set for one kilohertz. And let's turn this thing on. Let's plug it in first. All right, so far no smoke. Let's turn the power on. Whoa, okay, <laughs> what is that? So that is the left channel and that's looks like it's in oscillation because if you look down here, the one channel is actually showing that there's a signal there. Uh, that's couple of watts you know the weird thing is I connected this to a set of speakers real quick and I didn't hear anything it played perfectly so there must be some kind of high frequency oscillation going on or something I'm gonna shut that off uh, feeling the heat sinks here now so it was only on for a minute but both sides are just lukewarm I wouldn't think that they would get warm that fast though. So I'm thinking we probably need to check a couple things. So the first... Okay, there's your reason why I wasn't hearing anything. It is oscillating at 4.4 megahertz. And you have about 2.5 volts RMS which that comes out to about 780 milliwatts, so just under one watt. Um, you can see I turn this on, and it is not tripping, strangely enough, it is not tripping the, um, you know, the protect circuit or anything. Of course, it's AC, that's why, but uh, that's kind of odd. So now we got to find out why we're getting oscillation. Okay, I'm now looking on one of the resistors that uh, drops the signal down from the preamp to go out to the headphone jack. And on the one channel, you can see we're at about 4.7 megahertz. And yes, I am at 2 volts per division. So you can see there is a terrible oscillation going on. And if I move the probe over to the other channel, same, same uh, resistor on the other channel, you can see there's nothing there but noise. So... Obviously, this is kind of a little bit different, the way this works. And uh, hold on a second. Let me get some schematics out. So if we look, this board's kind of a multi-purpose board. It sets up the signals that goes to your power, uh, power output indicators. 
it breaks down right here is where we were looking on these resistors and these resistors actually if you kind of follow them they go down along here you can see they just kind of follow down along here and then go over to the headphone jack so these are your headphone resistors they're a little bit heavier resistors like a one watt and then you can also see these actually are your adjustments to adjust the level meters for your power output meters so a whole bunch of things go on your protection circuit is here you see this little SCR so there's all kinds of things going on in here so we're, we need to check this out and find out why this one channel is oscillating so bad okay you can see where the scope is on that resistor down here and we've got our noise down there and if we move this up to here which is this diode which is actually right here and if I look at the front of the diode here I'm actually getting ah, a DC level so you see how it's sitting at DC right now right there and if I go to the other channel, okay, they're both the same right now. So now both channels are doing it. <laughs> oh boy. And I have both channels showing this now. So I think there's some loose connections in here because it keeps changing. Um, what I found is by disconnecting this channel here it totally got rid of all of the noise and if you follow the little drawing from here where it comes up there was the the noise was back here if you follow it down it goes directly to the output of the amplifier module so basically by unplugging unplugging that amplifier module all of that noise went away proving that it's being generated on these amp modules and I think part of it has to do with these plugs they're really not very tight they don't fit on here very well and if you wiggle them around it kinda makes that noise and I did clean those terminals when I had the, the had these out but I noticed when I plug these in they don't plug in super tight like you would expect so I'm wondering if maybe it's a connection problem so we're going to keep messing with this a little bit, and when I find out what's going on, I'll be back. So this little problem here is a really good example of why you kind of need to have a decent oscilloscope. And it doesn't have to be an expensive one, but really, uh, without an oscilloscope, just connecting speakers or something like that, you really wouldn't be able to, to see that high-frequency oscillation that's taking place in this amplifier you can't even hear it because it's above the response of your ears and of the speakers but yet there it is um, now when I first powered this up if you recall uh, be even before we we did the recap of you know we just had done only done the power supply if if you recall you had a little indication of what was going on because the power meter on the one channel was showing the you know like the amplifier was turned up even when the volume was turned all the way down but really other than that little clue without the oscilloscope we would not have known that this was going on so it's always good to put the scope on an amplifier like this um, when you're troubleshooting it the other thing you need to remember is this is a little bit different than a lot of the other amplifiers we've serviced in that it uses power MOSFETs for the outputs and MOSFETs, the, uh, they're a real high impedance device. They're voltage controlled rather than current controlled. That's one of the difference between a MOSFET transistor and a bipolar junction transistor. Uh, bipolar junction transistors uh, work off of current gain and these work off of voltage. And because of the very high impedance of the gate, they're very susceptible to things like this so that's kinda of what we're seeing an example of so right now I have the oscilloscope connected to the gate of the good channel and if we look at the good channel over here we pretty much 
don't have any signal there at all. But if we take our probe and we move it over to the gate of the other channel, and hold on, I'm going to have to move the camera for a minute. Okay, we're on the same point of the other channel now. If we look over here, you can see a pretty nice clean uh, 5 megahertz oscillation. And uh, we are looking at 2 volts per division, so it's a pretty substantial voltage on that gate. Now, right now it is not hurting the circuit, um, but you can see how it changes, how it gets all kinds of noise. And obviously we have a noisy semiconductor somewhere. That's what's going on. Now, my suspicion right now is that we could have a problem. These power MOSFETs right now, the way they're mounted in the heat sink. Uh, let me get this out of the way. If you look down in here, they're mounted using a socket and the pins on these sockets sometimes will come loose. Now in this particular installation, the way this is put together, you can't really get into these sockets to repair them or to, uh, to tighten up the connections. If there's not a really good connection on here and there's some noise, that'll really show up on these. So that could be one problem. Uh, I will tell you I did a little bit of probing around and at the front end of this amplifier module we're not seeing that noise so all of that oscillation is taking place somewhere in the driver or the final section uh, of this channel so that's where we are so we're gonna have to remove this uh, this channel back out this module and kinda look at it a little more closely and see if we can find where that oscillation is taking place Okay, I've removed the board and this heat sink and everything, and we're going to tighten up those sockets first to try, although I think we probably have a leaky transistor. But I kind of wanted to show you guys a little trick. Um, busted out the uh, Simpson 260 analog meter, and I'm going to show you an easy way to check MOSFETs. Even these power MOSFETs you can check this way. And it's kind of a neat little thing. Um, you start by connecting your meter, your negative lead of your ohm meter, and you set it on ohms. I, I just have it set to readings times 100. Um, <clears throat> you, set your, you put your negative probe onto the source. On these uh, big power MOSFETs, the case is actually the source, and then you have the drain and gate, and depending on the orientation, you can see how there's like a, the pins are closer to one side and further from the other. So that's how you orient this to find it. And the drain is going to be on your left. If, if you have the, with respect to this, if you hold it with the short side down, your, your drain is going to be here and your gate is going to be on the right. Okay. And to do this, all you're going to do is connect your negative lead on here. And the first thing you want to do is check between the source and the drain. And if we look, there's just a little tiny bit of reading on the meter. Can you see the meter moving barely? Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to charge up the gate. All right, so we just touch the gate. And then we come back to here. And now it reads. Do you see that? Now, while holding this on here, if I touch my finger between the gate and the source, it'll turn back off. So, move the probe back over, charge the gate. It's turned on. It's turned off. So, that's a good MOSFET. And that's all there really is to testing these. Um, so, this is what's called an enhancement mode. MOSFET. There are two different types, enhancement mode and depletion. And enhancement mode means when you put a signal onto the gate, it makes the resistance uh, go down. Whereas when you, on a, on a uh, depletion mode, which you, we saw the action of a depletion mode MOSFET, or JFET, I think it was MOSFET, I forget, on my video for the 
uh, the Carver Silver 9Ts. You remember there was like a, a muting MOSFET in there and it was a depletion mode. So it was normally uh, low impedance and you gated it for it to go high impedance. Whereas this one is high impedance and you gate it on to go low impedance, if that makes sense to you. So I hope that's just that little trick uh, helps you guys out. Now we're going to go and we're going to tighten up the uh, connections and we're just going to do a quick test to see if that makes any difference at all. I don't think it will, but we're going to check it. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot. <laughs> what I showed you was for a, an N channel. We were looking at the N channel MOSFET. For a P channel MOSFET, it's exactly the same test. The only difference is you're going to reverse your positive and negative leads of your meter. So uh, you can see, I'm just going to demonstrate this, put the positive on this one, and again, you touch the between the source and the drain, and you can see there's nothing. Then we touch this to charge our gate, hit it again, now it's turned on. Take your finger, touch the gate, and it shuts off. So charge, it's on touch it's off so again it works exactly the same as the end channel except you have to reverse the leads so just remember that if you're not sure whether the device you're testing is an end channel or a P channel all you need to do is try this little test of course you can go by the orientation it's always going to be if you're looking at it this direction you have the tall side facing up you're always going to have your source will be the tab, the case, your gate will be on the right and your drain will be on the left and it doesn't matter if it's PNP or uh, P channel or N channel it will always be source, gate, drain. So really all you need to do when you're going to test one of these is if the test works with it with the positive lead on the case you know it's a P channel so positive P. If the if the test works with the negative lead on the case, N, N channel. That's how you know. So I uh, hope that helps you out. Sorry about that. I left that part out. Okay, I get an awful lot of questions about these sockets. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people that are newer to the, to the electronics industry, you know, to this hobby, um, haven't, don't really see these TO3. This is called a TO3 package for a, a transistor whether it's a MOSFET bipolar whatever this is a TO3 case and I get so many questions about how do these work and how do they mount and how do they you know how do they make contact what are the sockets like so this is what a socket looks like for these now you can solder these in as well but when you have a socket like this it makes it a lot easier and you can see the way this works these two pins just plug into this little socket like this and push down in and those little pins kind of those little uh, tabs in there grip these pins then when you put the screw through the case and it tightens onto the back you can see the back right here there's a, a solder tab that connects the case through the screw to this tab here and that's how it makes connection so on this one they use these sockets in the same manner except they solder the sockets directly to the board now on this particular these newer ones the pins are kind of rounded they're like half moon shape there's one on each side on these older sockets the pins are actually straight you can see if I can zoom in there a little bit you can kind of see them they're straight and in order to make them, what happens is those pins will spread apart and then they don't make very good contact. Now on the gate, um, since it's such high impedance and such low energy, if it just barely touches, usually it'll work. But on the drain side, between the drain and the source is where you're going to have your heavy current. And if those pins are not tight, uh, you can get all kinds of strange problems, especially when current starts flowing through the circuit. So what we're going to do is you're just going to get in with a very very sharp pointy object and you just kind of go in from the side and just kind of pry these in just a tiny little bit not much and be very careful just a little bit and once you do that 
you'll see they'll kind of squeeze together and the opening between the two pins should be just a little bit smaller than the, the diameter of the pin itself. That way when you plug it in, if you plug these in and unplug them too many times, they get loose. And especially when you have to wiggle the transistor to get it out of the socket, it'll loosen those pins. And sometimes when you put it back together, you don't get good contact. So we're just going to go over and do that. Check the simple things first. And then if we need to go and troubleshoot these transistors a little further, we can. We know that at the input of the circuit, which is on this socket right up here, the, the oscillation is not taking place in here. So it's happening somewhere in this area here, between here and here. So it's either something because of a loose socket or one of these transistors is beginning to leak and causing that failure to happen. So we're just going to scrutinize this very closely and then put it back together and just kind of leave it hang here and try it and see if we made any improvements. Okay, I think we found the problem. If you look at this resistor, it's kind of smudged. Other than that, it looks pretty good. But actually when I measure it, it is completely open. And that resistor is only supposed to be 4.7 ohms. Now let's take a look on the schematic what it is. If you look, <clears throat> this resistor here is called is in series with this little point, what is it, 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor. And what we call this is this is called a Zobel network. And if you notice, here's the output of your MOSFETs. Here's your little uh, suppression coil here, and then right at the output, this is actually going out to your speakers you have this little network and the purpose of this is to prevent high frequency oscillations. So that makes total sense if this were open how you could get kind of a runaway oscillation on this randomly. So we're going to replace both of these components and I'll probably do the same thing to the other channel as well just for good measure and uh, put it all back together and see what happens. All right, there's our first board all done. And right there you can see there's the culprit. And now that it's up out of the board, you can kind of see the little burn mark. Now, the reason this happens a lot of times is, again, the Zobel network is there to suppress any high frequency oscillations. But you can simulate that by putting a very high frequency into the amplifier. So if you run this amplifier at very high frequencies above 20 kilohertz for any length of time, these resistors will actually begin to heat up and they can open like that. That's their job is to suppress that. So uh, that's why a lot of amps, when, when you look at the service manuals, they'll tell you not to put very high frequencies into the amplifier for a long period of time. I know I've mentioned this on other videos. But that's a result of what can happen. Uh, this resistor here that I replaced is a metal film, very high quality. It's the only one that I had in stock of this size. And even though it is physically a little bit smaller, it is the same rating. It is a 2 watt 4.7 ohm resistor. So there you have it. I'm going to put this in. I'm going to do the same thing to the other channel just for good measure. And then we're going to test it all back out again. You know, I probably should have gone ahead and checked these things before I put it all back together. Those couple of resistors and so forth, they kind of looked okay, but... As my grandmother used to say, what you don't carry in your head, you carry in your feet. She was a wise woman. All five foot two of her. <laughs> she, uh, smart lady. She, uh graduated from high school they skipped her several grades she was graduated from high school at the age of 15 and went on probably by the age of 19 or 18 she had her college uh, bachelor's degree in teaching and she was a school teacher because of course back in those days she was born in 1908 uh, women weren't allowed to be anything but a school teacher or a nurse and that's a shame because she really wanted to get into science and things and uh, just wasn't wasn't a thing back then but 
anyway she was a smart woman and unfortunately I don't think I got much of that from her <laughs> I kinda have to work pretty hard to learn things myself but anyway interesting story so we're gonna take this apart and yeah the, even these ones were really really loose you could see how easily they just pop right out so we'll do the same thing to this side okay we're all back together and I have the probe hooked up on the gate of the uh, transistor that was oscillating and we're back on our oscilloscope and now for the moment of truth let's see what happens here will it work contact all gone and if we look at our power output meters they aren't lit up anymore with no signal all right let's put it together and test it I think uh, we fixed our problem all right guys here's all the marbles um, we have the two channels set up and then this little red line down here I just have for FFT and it's based on channel one and that's just going to kind of let us see uh, a little more visually when the distortion starts to come up so you'll see the uh, you'll see the fundamental one kilohertz come up and then when the other ones start to come pop up a little bit you'll see your distortion but anyway let's see if this works so far as you notice there's absolutely no uh, oscillation that noise is just the cheap uh, USB scope that we're using here but let's check it out and you can see your fundamental coming up and and this is one of those goofy detented uh, volume knobs so I have to kind of hold it between two detents but right there you start to see the the harmonics coming up from the distortion and if I just drop it a little tiny bit you can see it cleans up pretty good and we're looking at 2.35 volts or 23.5 volts so that gives us 69 watts so we're getting 69 watts per channel at uh, with uh, very low distortion and that's about to be expected this is a 60 watt per channel receiver so uh, it's all fixed everything's working now the only thing left to do is the the bias um, I haven't set that yet but that's not super critical well it's one little simple thing I'll go over it with you and then we're gonna end this video part one and uh, go and uh, get it posted up so the bias setting on this thing is pretty easy. Um, all you need to do is you see this big ceramic resistor here and the same thing on the other side. Uh, you just clip your millivolt meter right across that resistor and you tweak this potentiometer right here until you get 50 millivolts. Now I recommend before doing this you want to uh, let the amplifier warm up for about five minutes or ten minutes and uh, make sure everything's stabilized and then we'll set it and you can see we're pretty close right now we're at 39 millivolts um, and we don't care plus or minus it depends on how you connect the probes so that's not a big deal so let's set this up and again this helps you out with crossover distortion minimizing it and that's good right there and we're going to go over and do the other channel and then we'll set the power meter next okay to set the power meter all they have you do is connect to an 8 ohm dummy load they want you to put a 1 kilohertz tone in turn the volume up to maximum and turn the bass and treble up to um, midpoint and then they just have you adjust like this the output of your signal generator until you get about four volts RMS and then all you're gonna do is you're gonna go down and you can see you're gonna adjust these two pots right here for right and left channel until you get 
full scale deflection until these are just kind of flickering and you can see I don't know if the camera picks it up but this last LED is just flickering at that 4 volts RMS then they have you put 28.2 volts and verify that and go into the high meter mode and make sure that it reads 100 watts which would be full scale here which you're clipping pretty hard at 100 watts by the way so anyway that's all there is to it let's turn this back down the amp is now working perfectly everything is done on this uh, we're going to end this video or right here at part one and uh, we're going to do part two uh, we're going to split off and do the tuner as a separate part and the reason we're going to do that is I get a lot of questions about quartz synthesized tuners because they're kind of different than a uh, an analog tuner so I thought since this was an early digital tuner it's not the earliest but being 1980 it is a very early model and has one of the early designs on it I'll dedicate part two to just uh, going over the tuner a little bit and we'll talk about that a little bit so I hope you enjoyed this version uh, of uh, or this part part one and uh, stay tuned for the next part that will be coming up whenever I can get around to it and as always I wish you all peace joy happiness and good health in your lives and uh, I wish you all well and with the holiday season I wish you all a happy holidays and a very Merry Christmas that's only a couple days off so that's going to kind of date this video a little bit but uh, there you go all right have a wonderful time we'll see you next time around bye bye